Hello, game theorists. So in our last couple of videos, we looked at majority rule and plurality rule. We found that both of them have some undesirable properties. Now we'll turn our attention to some other methods out there. So one alternative is what's called the Burda count. All voters rank all candidates and they do so in this way. So you give one point to your least favorite candidate and then two points to the second worst candidate, three points for the third worst, etc. All the way up to you have n candidates total. So they get n points. So each voter goes and fills out their ballot and you get the points from this and most points wins. So this system is also imperfect. The problem here is that we're once again going to violate that condition of independence of irrelevant alternatives. <coughs> so again, that's where if you prefer A over B, if it's just A and B, you should still prefer A over B if it's a choice between a, B, and C. Adding C should not flip your preferences. So how can this arise from the board account? Well, if you take out one of these candidates here, that's going to change everybody's scores. And that can even reverse the outcome of an election. So IAA is that independence of irrelevant alternatives we talked about. So here's an example to show you how that can happen. So let's say we have two voters who think this way. A is their top candidate, and they think B is the second best, and C is the worst. So the board account, A would get three points, and B would get two points from each of these voters, and C would get one point. Now you have another two voters who think B is the best, so they're giving B three points each. And these guys think that C is the second best, so C is getting two points from each of these two voters. They believe A is the worst, so A is getting one point each from these two voters. Our last voter thinks C is the best and gives that kind C three points. And A is the second best. So I give him two points. And B is the worst. One point. All right, so let's find each candidate's board account. So 
is getting three points from these two voters. So three votes from each of them. So three times two. And these two voters give a one point each. So two times one. And our last voter gives a two points. So that comes out to 6 plus 2 plus 2, which is 10. So A's board account is 10. Let's see how many points B is getting. So these two voters each give B two points. So that's 2 times 2. These two voters are going to be three points each, so that's two times three. Our last voter gives B one point. So we have four plus six plus one, which is 11. Lastly, we count up C's board account. These two voters give C one point each. So that's one times two. These two voters give C two points each. So two times two. Our last voter gives C three points. Two plus four plus three is going to be nine. So B wins because B has a higher board account, 11, than A or C. So that's the outcome of the report account. Now I have to show how this violates independence of irrelevant alternatives. So imagine what would happen here if C were to drop out. So it's just A and B now. Well, if C drops out, we have three people who prefer A, and we have only two who prefer B. So now it's a two-way race. So we have these two voters They're giving A two points now because only two options, so two points to their top choice. And B gets one point, because again, only two options, so worst kind of gets one point, next one gets two points. <coughs> so again, with only two options, you only give your Top candidate two points. These two voters, B is our top candidate, so they give B two points, and A would get one point because A is their worst candidate if C is not under consideration. Our last voter down here prefers C the most, but C is has dropped out, so if it's just A and B, A is their favorite, and A gets two points, and B gets one. So these two pairs of voters have opposite preferences, so they cancel out, and see this one's going to be decisive, so now A wins. So that's a violation that independence of relevant alternatives. If it's just A against B, A prevails. 
but if it's a, b, and c, then b is suddenly better than a. So that's not right. So the board account also has flaws. Moving on, let's look at another alternative. This one is called range voting. So to motivate range voting, you can think about not just who is your favorite candidate, but also try to capture how strongly do you prefer that candidate? So you think A is only a little better than B, or do you think A is way, way, way better than B? That could have some implications for society's welfare. If 51% of voters think A is a little bit better than B, but the other 49% would much prefer B, then society would be happy overall with B, even though B is only getting 49%. So the way range voting works is you rate each candidate on a scale from, let's say, 0 to 10. So you got how many points they get and the highest score wins. So there's an illustration of that idea I was talking about earlier, how you're trying to capture the intensity of preferences. Let's say we have two candidates, X and Y. So two of our voters think that X is going to get 6 and Y is 5. So they prefer X over Y, but only by a little bit. But you have one voter who thinks that X is absolutely horrible, a zero, and they give Y a 10. So they really like Y and they absolutely hate X. So if you go after scores, X is going to get Six from each of these two voters, so six times two. And this person who hates X gives them zero, so the total is 12 for X. So these voters each give Y five, and there are two of them, so five times two. The other voter gives Y a 10, so we have five times two is 10, 10 plus 10 is 20. So Y wins. So under range voting, that would be the outcome, but under all the other systems we've seen so far, they'd say, well, X would get a majority of the votes under majority rule or plurality rule or whatever, so under other systems, X would prevail. So not be capturing, these other systems do not capture how Y is very strongly preferred by one voter. And you can see how this idea could be uh, important for welfare, even just in your everyday life. So back in the days when restaurants were open, um, freely, that is, um, if, say, two of you prefer one restaurant over the other, but the third person in your group has some very bad food allergies for that restaurant, then even though the majority prefer that one restaurant, you might go to accommodate the person who has allergies and go to a different restaurant. So even though that different restaurant has a minority support, one friend out of three, that could still be the best choice overall for the group. And range voting can capture that. These other systems do not.
So lest we think that range voting is perfect, um, there's a problem with range voting too. You may have seen a pattern here. We look at some new system and it always has some flaw. The problem with range voting is that you're going to have strategic voting. People will not vote according to their true preferences. We said that could be an issue earlier when we talked about, um, we talked about plurality rule. So you might not vote for your favorite third party candidate because you don't want to waste your vote and throw the election away to the other party. So in this example here, if everyone votes sincerely, then this, then why is gonna win? That's gonna be the right outcome for our society overall. The problem though is that people will probably not vote according to their true preferences. So if you think X is a little bit better than Y, if you vote in this way, you have very little influence over the outcome. So these two voters were probably gonna vote instead, they're probably gonna give X 10 points and Y zero in order to maximize their influence. And the other issue we talked about earlier about strategic voting is that once your votes do not reflect your true preferences, you start doing things like this, then the outcome of the election no longer reveals the will of the people. So we're not really assured the election winner really is the best choice for society. So range voting really is also flawed. There is another system called approval voting. So each voter for each candidate can set, select approve or disapprove. So that we can vote for, you can effectively vote for multiple candidates. So one thing that's nice about that is that if you like some third party candidate, you can still support them and also still support your preferred major party candidate. So if you're back in 2000 and you like Ralph Nader, but you don't want to throw the election at George Bush, you can vote for both Ralph Nader and Al Gore. So this was a way to get third parties some influence. And the candidate with the most approvals will win. The problem though here is that approval voting is just a special case of range voting. So voting approve 
is like voting, giving them 10 points, and disagree is like giving zero points, so all the same problems of range voting apply to approval voting. So you still get strategic voting, and when you're strategic voting, then the overall outcome might or might not be the will of the people, so you don't have that assurance. So why do you keep running this issue of strategic voting? It comes up in both approval voting and in range voting and also in plurality rule, it turns out there's a theorem behind it. So this is the, um, let me make sure I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I wrote it down my notes so I can spell it right. Gibbard and uh, somebody else. Okay, the Gibbard and somebody else theorem shows that if you have three or more candidates, then you're going to have strategic voting unless you have a dictator agent. We learned about dictator agents back in um, back in part one, where we had Arrow's impossibility theorem. Now, I'm not going to interpret that as saying, just give up, you're not going to find a good system. Remember, the dictator agent we saw in Arrow's impossibility theorem, and someone we see here, does not have all the horrible things to think about when you think about dictators. Remember, we said dictator agent examples were things like um, Joe Manchin in the Senate. So, the way Joe Manchin votes and the way the Senate as a whole votes are pretty much always the same. Or in the Electoral College, Pennsylvania is a dictator agent. Whoever wins Pennsylvania wins the election. But if you think about Pennsylvania swing voters or about Joe Manchin, you don't see him doing things that you associate with dictators like locking up their enemies in prison or suppressing free speech of their political opponents. You don't see moderate spring voters in Pennsylvania doing that. So a dictator agent in democracy might actually not be the worst thing in the world. So I do not interpret this theorem to mean give up, you'll never find a good system. It just means you gotta be aware that a lot of systems will tend to generate strategy in voting. So well, I've been kept saying don't give up and find a good system. That's because in our next segment, we'll find a system that has a lot of good properties. So be sure to tune in for that.